that's really important is to grab it at the right end. Why that look? Watch. You can tell because the red's a bit darker than the tails. There he goes. There's another one. Hopefully that's mud. So let's go and get ourselves some free fishing bait. I'm off lobbying. Well, I call them lobbies. Lobworms, earthworms, night crawlers. Call them what you want. I think they're called night crawlers uh, over on the other side of the pond, as they say. But anyway, they are one fantastic bait. They catch everything. They catch chub, they catch barbel, they catch eels, they catch bream, they catch tench, they catch roach. I think I even had a gudgeon on one once. Eels, you name it. Anyway, what you need to do is get yourself out on a dark, obviously, that's why they call them night crawlers, um, damp. It needs to be damp in my opinion. So it's been raining for most of the uh, evening. Uh, it's stopped now. And what you need to do, because you probably had a little bit windy in the background, is find somewhere shelter, because they don't like wind either. They don't like it on top of them. Quite sensitive little creatures, and you have to get yourself out there. If you can find a village green or uh, a park where the grass is short, or if you haven't got that, because you're sort of living in a city, or you can't get to a park, or you don't want to travel that far, then the grass verges will do you. And what I mean by that is, by the roadside. So have a little look round and see what you can find because it's well worth the effort. You've got to keep your eye out. Sometimes nice short grass. This is obviously somebody's uh, garden out at lawn. They're, uh, oh, hey, oh. Never walk past one. Never. There you go. Now ordinarily people's grass is not the place especially on the main road because um, I think people uh, manicure the gardens, fertilise a weed killer and rubbish off the road as you can see I'm on the main drag but they were one and uh, we'll keep hunting and you'll know when you find the right spot because look here look they just laid there just for the picking look how many there is you walk past these all the time in dark, not even knowing they're there. Look at that lot. Incredible. Easy picking up. Gentle. Nice and gentle. Just like that. You can hear traffic going past. So if you find a little sweet spot, like this, won't take you long to get 50 or so lobbies, which is enough to catch all the fish you've ever going to need. So there we go guys, I've collected a couple of grass sods and some leaves because it's that time of year when they're falling and I've got my tub, I've got a nice little haul, let's get back to the garage and just uh, check them over, put them to bed and uh, let's see if we can't catch some fish on them. So we're back in the warmth and the daylight and we're just going to tip them in here just to see what we've got. So I just grabbed a couple of grass sods like that because they love that and a few dead leaves. Let's just tip them into there and there you go. Absolutely tons of them. Look at that one. Perfect. That's took me about 20 minutes because it was a perfect night. Choosing the night is the most important thing. Damp, get out of the wind, find somewhere that's short grass so you can actually grab them and see them. If you uh, haven't got no street lights to help you with, then the torch off your phone or a very dim torch will do you well because when they see a bit of bright light, sometimes they retract into the, um, into the grass and they'll just all settle into them grass sods. I'm going to put them in a bucket with a lid on, a few leaves from to eat, and uh, let's go fishing. Mm -hmm. 
So we found ourselves bringing our fantastic lobworm bait to my favourite venue, and I can't understand why it won't be everybody's favourite venue, the mighty River Trent. We're on a stretch called Burton Joyce Roadside, which is iconic. People have been fishing here for, well, forever, because it's easy access. Park just behind your peg, it's a day ticket water, and flowing right past this road is this beautiful piece of river. This, this river's changed over the years. Um, it used to be iconic for catching chub and roach and float fishing back in the day. You'd find people every 15 yards trotting stick floats and fishing wagglers in matches. But today it's more commonly known for catching barbel and uh, specimen anglers, bream fishing. There are matches on here, but it's not quite as um, popular with them. And the club's controlled by, uh, the water's controlled by a club called Ashfield Anglers. And the upper and lower stretches um, uh, are membership waters, but these 20, 28 pegs, I think it is, uh, you can come and day ticket uh, fish them. So that's where we are today. And I know for a fact that there's barbel here, there's bream here, there's chub here, there's eels, there's perch, there's roach, and a million days. And um, let's see if we can't catch one of them on our lobbies. We're, uh, we've hooked the plug. Is this one of the downsides? The I'm afraid so. Good news is, with a bit of experience and skill, you can get your lead back. I've uh, snapped my hook length up, so my hook was stuck. But we need a rig check to make sure that when we do hook a fish, we're not going to park company because of laziness. A little bit of debris coming down. A little bit of debris, but let's um, let's just have a little look. Most people will know that uh, ordinarily I would only have a lovely hook box full of hooks, and they'd all be pre-tied to a certain length, and I'd have all the different sizes. Hey, up, oh, get your glasses on, Mick. Um, all the different sizes to all the different lines. But trust me, this is no place for that. This is spooler line like so, which in this case is 026, I'm just going to turn that down, it's nice and thick, because if they're going to pick a great dirty lobworm up, they won't be inspecting the hook length, so I'm actually going to whip up, this is a B983 camera sent, size 8, it's got a nice big eye, but I'm actually whipping it like a spade, a good tug and I'm actually whipping it up against the eye. Mind your teeth. And just create myself an up length. That'll be about 1.2 metres long. Not too short because we're fishing a straight lead and I just want that line to lay on bottom and by making it slightly longer it'll just lay nice and easy give the fish chance to pick me up bait up and um, get it in its throat before it feels the lead. So a nice long hook length with a nice big hook and basically what I'll do then is thread myself a lobworm on. A nice big full lobworm is a perfect bait, it's got all the juices in it. When you look at the hook bait that we're going to put on, that great big thing, you need to make sure that obviously you thread it up right because when that fish grabs that, you want that hook to be exposed so the fish can actually, so you can hook the fish. So a great way of doing it is to go right in to just get a little squeeze like that and you find its mouth, thread it on like that, on a little bit, and I'll explain why in a second. Back out of its side. Back in, just above the collar. And then back out in the middle of the collar. And that is where we're gonna anchor the worm in a little while. Hold on, he's still wriggling this guy. And then last time through is near the bottom 
through the side like that, thread it on a little bit, just enough to lose the hook. I'm just going to pop it over the eye look and the hook is inside the worm, the point is exposed. And the reason why I like to do that is because when a fish grabs that, and this is why I'll show you why we put a shot on in a minute, when the fish grabs that, I want that hook to be in the bottom. I'll tell you what, it's a lively character, this one. I want it to be in the bottom of the worm. Pop him back inside. But to hold him in place, I'm actually going to take this as a, it's a number four split shot. Just going to squeeze it on that hook length there, like that. Hold on to me hook. Slide the shot. I've, I've hooked myself, look. That's how sharp them hooks are. And then all I do is slide up that shot accordingly to match the length of the worm. And that will hold my worm in an elongated fashion like that so it's fully stretched so that when the fish grabs it, it's not all bunched up. If I didn't have that shot on, the whole worm would slide down there and it would be in the way. I can just actually push that up a little bit further, like so. Look at that, look. And you can see as the worm stretches and relaxes, there you go, look. That shot is just behind its head and that's perfect. It'll grab it like that. And that's one way you can do it. You can also hook it through the head and leave a lot dangling, but I sometimes find that if you get a fish like a chub, they grab at the bottom, they chomp it all the way up, and all you're left with is a little bit of worm, and you hook, and you don't hook the fish, you just finish up with a bit of worm left. That's a great way of doing it. You can cut it in half and just hook two pieces in a simple fashion, however you feel fit, and you can try different ways. You can just put a little piece on. So for instance, if you just slide that down, and I've got that hook, you could do that look. So you've got a nice big long length of worm and your hook is a bit higher up where it's come out in the second part. And just by moving that shot, it'll just adjust it and take the pressure off the hook. You see that? That's a cracking way of hooking those, of hooking those worms. Hit the bottom and we pay a load of slack off because there's that much flow to get away with what is, I'm using a four ounce lead, that'll put me a big boy in the line. So that means that the line's going right down like that and back up so that if I try and keep a tight line, all the flow is pushing against my line and just going to drag my lead around. This way, the line behind my lead is probably facing exactly downstream. So that means it's passing over it and there's not as much water pressure on that line. What I'll finish up with is a little bow down stream here and that's the only place where the water will be pushing it. So it means I can fish a lighter lead, which means when I do hook a fish, I have less chance of getting it snagged. It's nicer for casting, nicer for hooking bites. It's just nicer basically. So that's the idea of paying a big boy into your line. Really important. We're going for it. I just feel that that's it, my little reed bed. That's the only trouble. Were he really? What like that one? Just had a bite. Just had a bite. Honestly. When you're fishing with single up baits, because basically that's what fishing with a lobworm is. You're not feeding, you're not building a swim. You're actually freelining, I suppose, a single up bait. And when you think about it with that kind of logic, what you've got to do is you've got to find the fish. You've got to chuck to them. Because how on earth are they supposed to find? Yeah, it's a massive bait, but look at the size of that river. 
So you've got to chuck to them. So we're going to try different little different spots, short line on that crease. Might even go out into middle of the river, but I'm just going to have a chuck, short, just just down there because that is nice and smooth water where we know chub like to live in the margins. There's still a bit of flow there. I might be able to get away with a lighter lead there, but we'll just have a little chuck there. See if we can't get a bite. Because, of course, these fish will probably be swimming in and out at flow, and they'll find somewhere that they're comfortable. That might be where the, the flow of water is right for them, where the level of oxygen is right for them, where a line of debris, where there's natural food coming down. So, really important to search around the river, because you'll soon find out if there's one there, because they're aggressive. They're hunting fish, natural fish like this. They have to hunt for their food. They're not like on a commercial fishery where they know for a fact that someone's going to turn up tomorrow and pile a load of pellets in. So, important little tip, hunt around. What's really interesting is I've had a couple of wraps. Um, I don't mean rod wraps, I mean little taps and bangs and I've struck at one and I come back and had bait weren't marked. I've had another one with baits marked. So I've just gone out with that lobby head because I want to know what they are so that I can understand what I'm fishing for. If they're small fish, then I'm probably going to put two lobbies on to get away from them to try and catch my target slightly bigger fish. And although I just want to catch fish and I'm not trying to be too selective, I don't want to spend my session chasing ghosts thinking that I'm going to keep getting these bites and one's going to turn into a big chub or a big eel or a big perch if the four ounce rot. So just to try and encourage that and find out what's happening, the lobworms that I've been winding back in that I think are kind of a bit spent, you know, they've been on the line, they've got holes in them when I've had milk. I'm just going to put them inside a, one of these black cap maggot feeders got quite a few holes in it and that'll give me a bit of scent so I can hopefully snare one of these what I think are small fish and then find out what what the target audience is chub chub Joe I'm trying not to go down too early Slowly, because the most important thing is that we get a chub out of the job. If I can't do it, I'll find out how to do it. Has he let go? Did you see that? There must be small fish, because that surely would have been on. And that just goes to show you a bit of fresh ground. So I've just dropped down and went over a cast. It's only 20 metres. And immediately, we've had, a, we've had a bite. And I'm going to sit up into that one. What on earth is going on? Ah, dear. That's all that's left. They've took me lobworm. And I'm going to catch him. So although we made getting these worms look easy, because we were just picking them off grass because the night was perfect, that might not happen again for a week or two, and I might need to save these worms. And to me, they're quite valuable in the fact that I ain't got to go out breaking me back in the dark, wet nights. So keeping them, and you can keep these really easy. I transport them, and I think I probably told you when I collected these worms, that I like to get some grass sods from the area where I've collected them from, and leaves, which I know that's what they eat, and some soil. Now I've got them in a bucket because I brought them down onto the bank but you can keep them in that sort of medium which is soil and leaves and, and grass sods. Sometimes a little bit of damp newspaper ripped up into strips that's, that sort of holds the moisture and you can keep them in a big bucket with a lid on got sort of a few holes in it be handy but or you can put them in a pillar case because I've actually brought mine in an old pillar case that uh, we don't need anymore and that allows the air to get them to breathe moisture to seep out, they're not going to get soggy 
and I think they'll last two months with ease. Well, despite the fact that it, oh, that line's rubbing on something, we better just keep a bit of pressure on that to keep it out of any snags. Oh, it feels like a good fish. And it just goes to show you that we thought the river has come up two inches and it's all gone a bit swirly and a bit horrible and, and we've not had no bites off them small fish. And sure enough, from nowhere, we've hooked a fish. A good fish. There's a lot of flow here, so I'm not going to try and be heroic. We're going to just take his time and let the flow do the work. I think this could be a barbel. I think there's a bit of rubbish on line as well, which I keep feeling grating. And but as I said earlier, we've got good, strong mono on it, which you can see now why. You don't want to be fishing all day and worrying whether your tackle's going to stand up to it when you do finally get a bite. And if it is a barbel, sometimes this is a crucial moment when they just decide when you get them near the surface and they get that crazy lunge. So just be aware of that if you're fishing in these sort of conditions to be ready for when it happens. And there it is, look, and it is a barbel. There it is, look, as predicted. And just be prepared for that because <laughs> it's almost guaranteed that that will happen. We'll probably get him on this uh, this goat. There he is. Oh, and that is a beautiful fish to catch on some free bait. The lobworms have done their job. Let's have a look. What a pristine fish that is. In fact, I don't think he's done yet. He's not. Uh, he's not ready. What about that beauty? A great fish on a rising river with our three hand-picked lobworms. What a cracking fish. Well, we're just going to have a. Another chuck out into that float. And when you look at that, that is pretty fierce. And I suppose that's probably an important time to say that how do you tackle a river like this, the mighty trend? Look at it. I'm not saying it's out of sorts, but it's rising river. It's coming up. Looked on the forecast. Some brilliant data online these days to tell you what's happening with river. And where do you start? Look at it. Here, where we are today, you've got the outfall that comes in, which comes in on this bank. And the river is coming down from Stoke Bard off, start, Stoke Bard off Weir, and it hits this bend, and this is a long straight, and it races through here. And ordinarily, when you're looking at an ugly river like this, in this condition, you'd naturally want to retreat to the margins to get out the way you think oh fish will be in there i don't want to go out there in that fierce water keep an open mind out there if you can see it it's nice and smooth it's a smooth flow in here 
you had this outfall coming with it, what created like what I call a crease. On the inside of that crease, when we got here, it was all nice and smooth. But as the water's risen, that's changed things and it's become all boily. And that isn't necessarily right for fish. And I'm now looking at the river and the nice smooth water with smooth flow, where I think fish will be comfortable, is actually out in the middle. So when you come to a river like this and you're in this situation, keep an open mind. There's not a lot of rubbish coming down the river. We've had recent floods, which has cleared most of the debris through. Um, there's not been many leaves, a little bit of grass. So I think the fish will be comfortable to sit in that fast flow. They used to flow. It, just because it frightens us, it doesn't frighten them. So pick your targets, have a look, search the river, have a look on the inside. That's what we'll be doing. That's what we have done. We've fished out in the middle. So, of course, that leads me then on to tackle. So for an industrial river like the Trent, you kind of need industrial tackle to match. And it's not for the faint-hearted. If you're going to start chucking leads from two ounce, three ounce, four, I've even got some six ounce leads on my side tray, then you need a rod to do that. This is a 13 and a half foot, 100 gram. This is the old uh, Dutch master, 100 grammer, with the hollow river top in. So that's not, not even got a quiver tip in it. It's a through action rod. The reason why I like that sort of rod is because it's got big eyes right the way through the tip. And it's not too uh, porky at the top and it'll give you a nice bend, you get a lovely drop back. If you do get weed on your line, it'll pass through those rings if you're trying to net a fish in these sort of conditions. So that's the first thing, the rod. A reel to match, a nice sizable reel. I've got like a 7,000 size on there. That's my old browning vipers. And then loaded onto that, I've actually got some new line that we're just testing and that's an 028, round about 10 pound breaking strain. That's got a limited stretch because I don't actually want, um, I want to be kind of direct and I want to see my bites. So a quick look at what can only be described as a simple rig. It's a running rig, my lead is running. But what I've actually done is I've took my main line, first thing on there, I've put a couple of uh, gripper stop, gummy stop type things. I've actually put two on. Now, I want these to act that when the fish takes my bait, it pulls the line through, hits those, and it sets the hook. But I don't want it to be fixed, which is why I've not fixed it, because I want it to be a safe rig. But I've put two on, because if my fish does get me into a snag, I want it to be able to pull against that and pull the lead out of the snag and get itself free. If obviously I do have a breakage, they are free running enough, they'll just slide through and the fish will pull that out of the way. Then I've got a snap link swivel on there and to terminate it, I've basically got a buffer bead which just goes straight through to a swivel. I've just tied that off there with a Palomar knot and then I've looped my hook length, which obviously has my beautiful lobworm on the other end. As I said, that's a metre. I've just done this short one for demo purposes. And that's just a loop off there. And when I cast that out, that'll just kick off with that buffer bead, like so. It couldn't be more simple, nice and easy. So it's like. Same as last time, there's like a snag there or somewhere. And I don't know what that is, I don't think that's a fish at all. It is now. Now we've got through all that. Or maybe not. No, I think it's crap and it's it's pulling through. It's like crap sliding down that line, which makes it look like it's a fish. I think as boars go in. Oh, no, it's a fish. fish it? Yeah, it's a fish. I don't know what the line's getting fast on, but incredibly, it must be feeding time. And that, I'm surprised we've actually got it that far because it were, my line, I think we're round some underwater obstacles. And this doesn't feel quite as big a fish, but Oh, I'll tell you what it is, look at that. 
I know somebody will be really pleased to see that. A friend of mine loves these fish. Look at him. Well, there's nothing like what they call a mixed bag. And these are the thing that really took me back years because I used to catch these cracking fish. He's eaten both of them uh, pieces of, of worm. There's only a tiny bit left. And that can, what can only be described as a magnificent <laughs> Trent chub. Look at that. That's on those three lobworms collected off the pavement. What a stunning Trent fish. Look at him. He's got the best part of three and a half, four pounds. So it's been a really interesting session because obviously I set off this morning, think right, the flow's strong but it's not unfishable. So I'm out in the main river. I didn't have a bite now. I've been told a little bit of local knowledge is that they catch a few chub close here and but I know there's some weed beds that are probably like sort of like six, eight metres front bank. And I weren't really sure about fishing down the edge. Anyway, I thought I'll try it because we'd not had a bite out in the floor. And I got a bite within 30 seconds. And that kind of led me down a bit of a path because I kept getting these bites and I kept missing them. And basically I was struggling to catch a fish. And ultimately I want to catch a fish on these worms. So, and I kept trying and trying and kind of led myself down a bit of a rabbit hole. I think they were dace and probably roach and small fish and I'm fishing with a sizeable oak with a big bait and I just don't think it was quite right for that type of fish. So the river came up a little bit and those bites dried up which then kind of made me look why they dried up and that's because this inside line had become boily and obviously the fish weren't comfortable in that but when I looked back out into the river the main you know the two thirds of the river past, past that sort of crease was smooth. So why not finish off where I started? I've gone back out over that. Well, that's where they were. The big fish are out in the floor. I've had a barbel and I've had a chub. And I'm sure we'll probably get another bite before long. And that just goes to prove that you mustn't stop searching. As I said at the beginning, it's a, you know, you're not feeding a swim, you're not trying to build anything. You're going to the feeding fish. So don't sit back on your laurels, don't get lazy. Have a little look around, search your swim. It's always important, regardless of what type of fishing you're doing, think about what the fish are doing and how they're thinking and how they're feeling. You'll catch more fish.